Howdy, howdy, folks. Once again, it's Donnie coming at you with another tutorial in the Linux storage management series. And today we're going to look at a utility called DF, which will allow you to view the amount of space that is being used and the amount of space that is available on your storage devices. And if we just do it like that, you see that we're going to get our display in terms of 1000k blocks. So you see here, this is dev SDA1. And by the way, this is the very, very simplest example of a storage setup on this particular machine where we just have everything set up with one big partition, just one big root partition here, as you can see. So you can see here the total number of 1k blocks that we have the total number that are used, and the total number that we have available. And this is the percentage of space that is being used here on this root partition. And then, of course, we have all these other things here. These are all our virtual file systems that Linux creates itself. There's really not anything that we can do with them. But just so you know, that's what they are. OK, so anyway. Looking at things in terms of 1K blocks might not be quite that useful to you. So we have a couple of other options here. We have the H option, the dash H option, which allows us to view our storage space in human readable format. So here now we see that we have a total of 20 gigabytes on this SDA drive or on this SDA1 partition, I should say. 6.3 gigabytes are in use and 13 gigabytes are available. And we can also look at the man page for DF and we can see a whole lot of other options. But frankly, most of these options you're probably not going to be using. But you can look through here and see what they all are. I'm not going to look at all of them. I'm not going to try to explain all of them to you, but you can look at them and see what they are. Anyway, next let's move on here to another example. And in this example, this is going to be on CentOS 6 this time. And if we do like this, do df-h like that, you see there we have a bit of a problem. We have, in this particular example, we have the dev mapper vg centos 6 web-lv root logical volume, and we also have the dev sda1. So dev sda1 here is the boot partition, and you can see there 477 megabytes total space on that partition, 59 megabytes used, 394 megabytes available, and 13% of it is in use. But up here we have this logical volume, and anytime that you install any type of Red Hat type operating system, whether it be Fedora or CentOS or Red Hat itself, if you accept the default partitioning scheme during the installation, you will get a logical volume set up. And so here we have this root partition is actually on a logical volume instead of just on a regular partition. But you see here we have a bit of a problem. We have this name of the logical volume that is so long that it just comes over here under the size and used columns. And then the statistics for that are down here in another row. Now, that's OK normally. But if you are writing a shell script which will use the output of DF in order to automatically monitor or, and report on the disk space that's being used, for example, then that's not going to work at all because this up here is going to mess up that shell script because the shell script is going to be looking for this stuff here on this line up here. And it's not going to find it and it's going to fail. So what we can do here is we can use the dash P, 
bash uppercase P. And this will give us what we call POSIX compatible output. So now we see that we have the whole name here, this long name of this logical volume here on this line. And the output that we want our bash shell script to see is on the same line. So now with that dash P, the bash shell script that we write will work. And of course, I did not put the dash H in there. I can do that just like so. And so now we have a human readable output and our POSIX compatible output. So now our bash shell will work just fine. And then we can come over here and let's try something else. Let's do, I'm looking for my center with seven. No, I didn't want center with seven, I want Fedora. And let me increase the font size just a tad bit there. Okay. So anyway, here's my Fedora machine. And this one, instead of it being a virtual machine, this is an actual production machine. And uh, this is a, the same machine I've been showing you in quite a few of my tutorials. This is a really, really old 2009 model Hewlett Packard workstation with a pair of quad-core Opteron CPUs in it. And I got it from eBay on the cheap a few years ago. I paid $175 plus free shipping for the thing. And it's been a real workhorse. It's a real workhorse machine. And one of the things I use it for, well, really the main thing I use it for is to set up virtual machine labs. I, I set up labs with lots of different virtual machines. So if we do DH, do or if we do the uh, DF rather on it, DF dash H like so, we see here the output and we see we, we've got quite a bit more going on here than uh, what we've had on the other machines. So here we have our logical volume, which is being used for the root partition. And uh, for some reason, I don't know whether it's just because uh, the name of that logical volume is shorter or what the deal is, but uh, uh, for some reason, I don't have to use that dash uppercase P option in order to get the POSIX compatible output. It's just there automatically, which is nice. But uh, but uh, regardless, you see there that I have uh, 50 gigabytes total on that root partition, 28 gig used, 19 gig available, and 60% use. And that, of course, is the root partition. And then down here, we have the home partition. And you can see there, 401 gig total, 343 gig used, Whoa, 39 gig available, 90% in use. Holy cow. Yeah. And it was worse than that until just a couple of days ago because a couple of days ago I tried to transfer a virtual machine from this computer over to it because I decided I wanted to use it over there instead of over here. And the transfer kept failing out on me and I couldn't figure out what was going on and finally gave up on it. Yeah, it didn't even occur to me that my hard drive was full. And so when I finally looked at that machine, I found out that, yeah, 100% full there. It was saying 100% full. And uh, uh, I said, yeah, I better clean up some stuff here. So I deleted a couple of virtual machines that I didn't need anymore and uh, some ISO files that I, I downloaded that I didn't need anymore, freed up some space. But uh, I really need to do something about this, you know. But uh, uh, the, the mistake I made when I first got this machine was not putting a bigger hard drive in it because it only came with a 500 gigabyte drive. And I debated about putting another drive in it. But and I, said, I finally decided, nah, I'll just go ahead and uh, go with a 500 gig drive. It should do me. Ah, uh, no, I was wrong. But anyway, there are a couple of ways I could go here. I could, if I wanted to, I could just go ahead and put a whole new drive in it and do a clean 
install the operating system. A two gig drive, or I mean, uh, rather, a two terabyte drive is the biggest I can put in because of the old BIOS that won't recognize anything bigger than two terabytes. But uh, I could do that, or I could just go ahead and stick in a second drive and add it here to this logical volume. And, you know, that would be, really be easier and faster. Well, the thing is, this drive that's in it now is very, very old. So do I really want to put that new drive into the same logical volume with a really, really old drive that could go bad at any time? Well, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I'll think about it. Not in a big hurry to do it because I do have other machines that I can use. So, uh, but yeah, someday I'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, some other things that we got going on here. We've got, of course, our virtual file systems that we saw on the other machine. So not a lot of difference there. Nothing we can do about them because that's something that Linux itself takes care of. But here we have something interesting. We have all these dev loop devices here, which are basically read only file systems for the Snap service. And Snap or Snapper or Snappy, I forget the exact name of it. But anyway, um, Snap packages are part of this system. And it's something that was invented by the Ubuntu developers as one of several different universal file formats for uh, for Linux, you know, that will run on any Linux distro. And uh, so you've got several of them. You've got the app image was like the original one. And then uh, you've got the snap invented by the Ubuntu people and flat pack invented by the Fedora people. But uh, anyway, you know, with, when you install a program on a Linux machine, normally if you have some sort of a Debian-based system, it's going to be installed via a .deb package with the apt utility or the dpkg utility. If you have a Red Hat type system, it's going to be installed via an RPM package via either YUM or DNF or RPM utilities. And so and lots of other different formats as well. You know, like every distro family has its own packaging format and it gets really confusing and it's hard for developers to have to maintain all those different versions of these different packages for all these different distros. So the snap package thing is one of several different ways we have to have a universal file format that can theoretically at least be installed on any Linux distro. And so you just have the developers creating their snap packages. And instead of having the developers of all the different distros having to modify that snap package, hey, you just have a central snap package repository that's maintained by the Ubuntu people. And you can install the snap system on any Linux distro, uh, theoretically any Linux distro and install your snap packages to get your programs that you want. And, uh, and then the snap system, the snap service will automatically update those packages for you. So you don't even have to worry about doing that manually. It just does it automatically. But as part of that system, we have the read only file systems for the snap itself and for any application, any snap package that you would install. So we have here, for example, I have only Office installed on here. And it's got three different read-only partitions on there. And when I say read-only, what I mean is that the human user cannot write to it, cannot do anything to write to it at all. But the system can, you know, when it needs to do updates or when it needs to, uh, uh, you know, do the installation or whatever, right? But uh, anyway, uh, that's what you see in here. You've seen all these different things here. You've got uh, the size there, total size of this particular file system, and the amount used is always going to be whatever this available size is. Those are always going to be the same, and you're always going to see zero available and 100% use. 
So when you see that on a system that has SNAP installed, don't get alarmed because nothing is wrong. It's just showing zero available and 100% usage because it is a read-only file system. That's the way it's supposed to be. And they do that for security purposes because your SNAP packages are running in their own sandbox environments, which is why when you install the SNAP system, you can install a SNAP package with just normal user privileges. You don't even need root privileges for it, right? So anyway, uh, that's uh, pretty much it, really, for the DF utility, except, as I said, you can look at the man page, and you can see the other options there, which might possibly be useful to you at some point. And as I said, I'm not going to get into them because the ones that I showed you are the ones which are the ones which you'll probably use most of all. Just those two options, the dash H and the dash uppercase P. Anyway, that's all I got for now. If you like the video, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. We'll catch you next time.